Did Pope Francis recently say that the SSPX is not in schism? Stick around to find out. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Reason of Theology. I'm your host, Michael, on a Tuesday. So I have been flooded with a ton of uh, people asking me questions about whether or not a bishop has recently claimed that Pope Francis said, the SSPX um, is not in schism. I want to take a look at what the bishop actually said because the video is available. So we're going to go to the source itself. I want to take a look at that. And also I want to just kind of review the video that the bishop has put out as a whole. It's only 16 minutes long. We're not going to watch the whole video because unfortunately it's in a different language. So I would need to sit there and pause and translate every bit of it through the closed captioning English translation. And that would just take way too long, but I will play the section that is relevant to the topic of the show title. However, for the other parts, I'm most likely um, going to just give a summary of it. We may look at a few clips here and there. Like I said, it's not very long, uh, but this is a video that was just recently put out by Bishop Vitus Huander, uh, who is the retired Bishop of Coeur in Switzerland, uh, who is carrying out his retirement in an SSPX house. <clears throat> and so he no longer has any kind of authority in the Catholic Church. He's not an active bishop. He's retired. So he, again, carries absolutely zero authority for Catholics. Uh, but he does in the video personally testify to some things concerning what Pope Francis has shared with him about the SSPX. And what I'm shocked by, I guess I'm, I shouldn't be shocked. Um, what I'm amazed by is the fact that a lot of people have put a spin on this that really should not be assumed and should not have been done. I'm amazed how many people haven't actually gone to the video itself and listened to what the bishop says in context. Because there are some things that the bishop says in context that works against the spin that so many people are putting on this to say that Pope Francis is saying and recognizes that the SSPX is not in schism. I'm just shocked that I haven't seen anybody pick up on this yet. So they're, they're either not paying attention to the video itself or not going to the video itself. One of the two. So that's what I want to look at. Uh, we'll go to that in just a moment, but let me just kind of review some things leading up to that. Um, he talks about how, again, he, he's retired and how the Ecclesia Day Commission, uh, this is the commission that is um, entrusted and was entrusted by John Paul II with reconciling the uh, schism of the SSPX with the Catholic Church. And he talks about how um, the Ecclesia Day Commission gave him permission to carry out his retirement in an SSPX house. He requested if this was possible. He says the Ecclesia Day Commission was supportive of it. And he kind of explains the rationale why he wanted to uh, live out his days there. It was, according to him, to get to know the inner life of the SSPX and how they work, and then compare the inner life of the SSPX to the inner life of a normal diocese and then to send reports to Pope Francis. That was kind of the intention. And you know what? That's kind of a good idea, frankly. I, I think that that's, that's helpful because that certainly has the potential to work towards reconciliation between the SSPX and the Catholic Church. So I actually think that that's a laudable um, intention. I do get the impression, having watched the video, that um, Perhaps the bishop has somewhat moved away from that intention um, and that he has now bought into the position um, and tenets of the SSPX. So it sounds like he's really formally adheres to and is um, overly sympathetic with its position. So this is more at this point than him living there to just simply work towards reconciliation and send reports back to Pope Francis. 
it's absolutely explicitly clear he has bought into the tenants of the SSPX when you watch the whole video. But I but I do commend the original intention there, even if I do question uh, the usefulness of um, his 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 position there at this point. OK, now it's interesting that he he talks about the different popes that he has experienced throughout his life. He talks a little bit about um uh, Pius the 12th and then uh, John the 23rd and Paul the 6th and John Paul the second and so on. And it's curious to see kind of what he highlights that is significant about their pontificates because the things that he highlights kind of shows me where he's coming from and what he prioritizes um, and what he finds to be noteworthy about these pontificates. And it, again, very much shows a reflection of somebody who has bought into the tenets of the SSPX. For instance, the way he really summarizes Paul VI pontificate is he believes that there is a significant rupture under his pontificate and that he uh, was a pope who highly favored very liberal circles. That That's kind of like the way he describes his pontificate in a nutshell. And the big thing for how he describes John Paul II, his evaluation of him is, well, the Assisi meeting of 1986. For him, that's like one of the most noteworthy uh, points about John Paul II, which again shows how he's kind of bought into the SSPX because that tends to be the most noteworthy thing for them, aside from the fact that John Paul II excommunicated their uh, founder, uh, Marcel Lefebvre, which turns out to then be the other thing that the bishop highlights about John Paul II, where he speaks of a grave injustice that was done to Marcel Lefebvre uh, by the church and specifically by John Paul II. He believes that Lefebvre was unjustly excommunicated. So again, that's kind of his evaluation uh, of him. He also talks about, by the way, under the pontificate of Paul VI, how the promulgation of the Novus Ordo Mise, the, the new... Uh, liturgy in the Roman Rite has caused great suffering and disruption to the unity of the church. Now, I think we can all agree that uh, abuses of the Novus Ordo has caused great suffering and disruption. I've personally experienced that, so I'm, I'm on board with that. But no, he, he's not saying abuses of the liturgy. He's, he's saying the liturgy itself, as it's promulgated by Paul VI, has caused a great deal of suffering and disruption in the church. And so you can, again, see where he's bought into the SSPX. Um, he continues to reiterate the things that is important to their platform. For, in, for instance, he says um, that the Second Vatican Council has caused a major rift in the church. Of course, we know it's not actually Vatican II that has caused a rift. Um, it's more so poor implementation and then faulty interpretations on both sides, on the radical traditionalist side with your SSPX and SSPX sympathizers, as well as rupture from radical progressives who want to break away from sacred tradition and break away from everything in the preconciliar period, as if the church just starts over and there's a new Pentecost at Vatican II. Both of those are wrong. That's really what has caused a major rift in the church, not so much the council itself. But again, you can kind of see where he's coming from uh, when you start to hear these things. I want to briefly, uh, before we get to the, to the you know, what everybody's excited about here as far as the show title, let me take a look at the eight minute and 40 second timestamp. I want to, um, I want to play a clip of that for you. I will read the translation in case you're listening to this in audio only. Again, he's speaking um, in a different language here, but I'll, I'll read the English translation that uh, YouTube has provided. Um, where he's going to talk about the unjust excommunication of Lefebvre. And then he is going to give some very faulty information about this, which shows you either extreme ignorance on his part um, or, or something else. Something else. I'm going to assume extreme ignorance on his part. Um, okay, let me go ahead and share my screen. And let's get his evaluation of the excommunication of Lefebvre. All right. Uh, you should be able to see it on your screen now. Please let me know if there are any difficulties uh, with hearing the audio. Let me double check, make sure audio is enabled. Okay. Uh, let's watch about 20 seconds of this clip. 
All right, he says here, with that, the Pope wanted to give back to the church the traditional Roman liturgies. Talking about uh, Pope Benedict XVI with Sumorum uh, Pontificum. And he says, in 2009, he also lifted the unjust. Even, even so hat ihr die ungerechte Exkommunikation von... The unjust excommunication of Archbishop Lefebvre and the bishops of the SSPX he had consecrated. For, first of all, um, I, I'm i shocked that he would be this ignorant. Again, I'm going to assume ignorance rather than intentionally misleading people. I'm shocked he would be this ignorant because a very basic reading of the lifting of the four excommunications of the excommunicated bishops reveals that Lefebvre's excommunication was never lifted, as I've pointed out in previous videos. It, it was never lifted. What is he talking about? The unjust excommunication of Lefebvre and the bishops of the SSPX he had consecrated? That's factually incorrect, and it's significant that his excommunication was actually not lifted. That doesn't mean it couldn't be lifted in the future. That doesn't mean it maybe even shouldn't be lifted in the future. That's a different question. But has it been lifted? No, it has not. The four bishops who he consecrated, their excommunications were lifted. We might question the prudence of it at this point, given that they have not still fully reconciled uh, themselves with the Catholic Church. So we may question whether or not this really was a good idea. Nevertheless, it is factually mistaken to say the excommunication of Lefebvre was lifted. It is 100% false, and I challenge anybody to show otherwise. Moreover, Moreover, he says the unjust excommunication. I will refer you to the videos I've done in the answering the SSPX playlist here on this channel. I highly challenge that. I mean, I, I strongly challenge that. I don't believe that it was unjust. It was outrageously clear that John Paul II bent over backwards to accommodate Lefebvre. And go and read Lefebvre's exchange with Ratzinger. Formerly, you know, Pope Benedict, before he was Pope, was Cardinal Ratzinger. Go and read his exchanges back and forth between Lefebvre. And you will see it was not that he was being unjustly treated. It was that Lefebvre was reneging on his agreements with the Holy See and backing out of agreements that he made and then trying to impose additional conditions that were unreasonable and trying to impose them on the Vatican at the last second. And so there, there's nothing unjust here taking place on part of the Holy See. It was unjust what Lefebvre was doing in breaking his agreement and then trying to modify the agreement and being unreasonable and uncooperative. And you can read this exchange on the SSPX website. I went ahead and reviewed some of these things. So again, maybe also check out the videos that I've done on answering the uh, SSPX playlist here on this channel. I'll include that in the show notes after this post on YouTube. But um yeah, judge for yourself. I'm not buying it. I'm not buying that this was an unjust excommunication. That tells me where this bishop is coming from. Not only is he factually mistaken, he has also bought into their position. All right, uh, let's move forward. Let's go to the next part, maybe the nine minute and 15 second mark here. Here he is going to talk about how Pope Francis breaks with tradition and has a pontificate of rupture um very very outlandish and irresponsible thing to say uh but let's hear it from the horse's mouth um so he says we can cause pontificate as it emerges up to that point a pontificate of rupture it's a break with tradition this can be underlined by the fact that the Es ist ein Bruch mit der Tradition. Dies lässt sich damit begründen, dass er selber immer wieder that he repeatedly or he himself repeatedly reprimands tradition and the faithful who follow tradition. Let, let me just stop right there. Rhetoric, nonsense, absolute nonsense. He's not reprimanding tradition and reprimanding faithful who simply follow tradition. Nonsense. You're selling us a bill of goods. What he's doing is he's reprimanding people who are trying to use quote-unquote tradition 
to dissent from the magisterium of the Catholic Church. We might argue, and I certainly argue, perhaps there's a better way to go about correcting this group? I think so. I, I think that maybe traditionis custodis wasn't the best way to handle the situation. But it's absolutely clear he's not targeting people just for the simple fact that they want to follow tradition. This is nonsense. Of course not. He even tells you what the intention is, and it's completely understandable given their behavior. He is talking about radical traditionalists who are trying to use the liturgy and trying to use the preconciliar church to somehow fight against the postconciliar liturgy and fight against the current magisterium, the postconciliar magisterium, as if there's been a major rupture when there has not been. That's who he's dealing with. That's what he's trying to do. And it's very clear the bishop is not honestly and accurately representing Pope Francis here. So it's very sad to see him buying into this kind of nonsensical rhetoric. Die Tradition und die Gläubigen, welche der Tradition anhangen, maßregeln. On the other hand, he takes acts, he undertakes acts that are clearly contrary to tradition, he says. Und Er nimmt andererseits Handlungen vor, die deutlich im Gegensatz zur Tradition stehen. Zum Syncretistic cult acts, such as in Canada. This, uh, well, before I read the rest, let me just stop there. Um, we just recently did a video where we walked through that ceremony in Canada. And what the bishop here says is slanderous and is false. It is a lie that continues to be spread online. Perhaps this video was shot before we did the video and before a lot of people have had the opportunity to hear the other side of the story. Maybe I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. But this still spreads a lie about Pope Francis in the Canada event. Go and watch it. I'll put it in the show notes. See for yourself whether Pope Francis participated in a syncretistic cult act. By the way, I'll say the same thing for the Pachamama issue. I'll put that also in the show notes if you haven't seen it. This is incredibly irresponsible. It's slanderous, um, and it is false. However, let me go ahead and steel man with what, what he's trying to say here, but let me do so in this case accurately rather than with misinformation. Let me try to steel man what he's saying. He's, he's effectively saying that the hammer is coming down on people who are sympathetic with your more traditional ways of doing things and not as you know rigorous and disciplining people who are incredibly progressive that so again let me try to steal man what he's saying there and if that's what we're trying to say i, I think that there's some truth to that um that doesn't take away from the fact that pope francis should be disciplining your radical traditionalists he should but it is important to note that, but he should also be disciplining your radical progressives. And I do think that they're getting away with a lot of things that they shouldn't be getting away with. So there is an inconsistency in his disciplining of dissenters. He has right to discipline your radical traditional dissenters, although I question the way in which he's going about doing it. But at the same time, inconsistent in doing so with your radical progressives and your father james martins um there are some legitimate criticisms that can be offered for this pontificate if that's what we're saying but if we're going to use this straw man and say well he's just against tradition itself and anybody who loves tradition while he's over here engaging in syncretistic cult acts come on this may have worked two years ago it's not going to work now. There's too much information that has become available to people to know better than to say this at this point and to know better than to buy into this. This isn't going to work. You're going to have to you're going to have to modify your criticisms of this pontificate at some point. It's just not going to work. This is ran out of gas. Uh, let's continue, though. He says the will to this break is evident. Beispiel synkretistische Kulthandlungen, so etwa in Canada. Offenkundig wird der Wille zu diesem Bruch unter anderem Among other things in the two apostolic exhortations Traditionis Custodis in den zwei apostolischen Schreiben Traditionis Custodis vom 16. Juli 2021 und Desiderio Desiderio 
in Desiderio Desideravi. With these writings, the Pope wants to eradicate the traditional Roman liturgy. Yeah, no, no rhetoric there, right? So the Pope is trying to break with tradition. He's trying to eradicate the traditional Roman liturgy. Stop this nonsense. The Roman liturgy has significantly developed over time, and the rupture and discontinuity that exists on the official level between the Missal of 62 and the Missal of 69 is not as great as the rupture that exists between the Missal of Trent, with the Missal of Pius V, I should say, and a first century Roman liturgy. There's greater discontinuity between a first century Roman liturgy in the Missal of Pius V, compared to any discontinuity that exists between these two Missals, the Missal of 62 and the Missal of 69, the extraordinary form and ordinary form. So stop talking about Roman, the traditional Roman liturgy. When, my goodness, if, if you think that this is the standard of tradition, how do you account for all of the significant changes between the first century by the time of the Council of Trent? Now, I'm not saying that there aren't legitimate developments to the Roman right. I'm not saying that these changes aren't legitimate. But I'm just saying, stop using this empty rhetoric that doesn't actually work, and that if you apply it elsewhere, you become inconsistent. Just say, I'm not happy with the reforms in the post-conciliar era. I think we need to walk back some of these reforms. I think we need to show more continuity between these two missiles. Couch it that way. Instead of in this nonsensical rhetoric of the Pope is just trying to break with the traditional Roman liturgy. Again, these arguments just are empty at this point, and they're, they're no longer going to work. You're going to have to revise that a little bit. I'm of the opinion that there is too much rupture between the Missal of 62 and 69. I take Benedict's position. I don't believe there's substantial rupture, but I do think that there's too much accidental rupture. And, and we do need to bring some more continuity between these two missiles. So I'm sympathetic to that position, but it's being overstated with inflammatory rhetoric by this bishop and others. And that's where it becomes unhelpful and inconsistent. All right, let's continue. Der Ravi vom 29. Juni 2022 mit diesen Schreiben will der Papst die überlieferte römische Liturgie ausmerzen. Andererseits ist On the other hand, he is an outspoken supporter of the so-called world religion. So I guess he means a one world religion. There you go. <sighs> yeah, he's clearly drinking the SSPX Kool-Aid here. He's a supporter of the world religion. Uh, again, I think that that's probably a not a, a, com a complete translation. I, I imagine he's trying to say the one world religion. That's what Pope Francis is trying to push here. This is for many faithful a stumbling block. Well, look, um, there are some very serious and legitimate criticisms that one can make about this pontificate. I, I believe that. But we need to do so accurately instead of this nonsense about, oh, he's trying to promote a one world religion. And he's trying to usher in the reign of the Antichrist and all kinds of ridiculous stuff that we continue to hear on a daily basis. Let's stick to your more level headed and accurate criticisms that can be leveled against this pontificate, such as the ones that I've mentioned so far on this stream. Einstein des Anstoßes. Für die Bruderschaft. All right, so let's go to uh, the 12 minute 26 mark where we're going to go to ground zero. Let's maybe start it a little earlier than that. Um, so this is the part that everybody is... Um, taking out of context and trying to use to say that Pope Francis is saying the SSPX um, is not in schism. And I'm going to show the spin that they're putting on it. And I'm going to point out something that nobody so far has picked up on into their shame. And I can't believe it because it's so explicitly clear. It's so abundantly clear. You can't watch this in context and miss what he's trying to say and see how it's different than the spin that people are putting on it. Okay, let's watch it der Krise begegnen und der Kirche damit beistehen wollte. 
Ihm war es... Uh, so he was mainly concerned with the faith of the church and the insecure and abandoned faithful. Talking about Lefebvre. Vor allem am Glauben der Kirche gelegen. Ihm war es an den verunsicherten und verlassenen Gläubigen gelegen. Im Anschluss an... Following what happened after Vatican II... Und ...die Entwicklung nach dem Zweiten Vatikanischen Konzil wurden viele Menschen... Many people became sheep without shepherd. For the Archbishop... The reason for action was primarily Schafe ohne Hirten. Der Grund zum Handeln war für den Erzbischof in erster Linie das Heil der Seele. The salvation of souls as well as the preservation of the purity of the faith. Okay, so this is important because this is the context. He's saying that Lefebvre's main motivation and intention was not to somehow break with the church, violate canon law, corrupt the faith, um, you know, lead people to hell, create a schism. No, his main intention was to preserve the faith and also to secure the salvation of souls. That's important because this comes up a lot with the SSPX in context. Canon law is there to serve the salvation of souls not the other way around, right? Kind of like your, you know, the Sabbath is uh, made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Canon law is made for the salvation of souls, not salvation of souls is made for canon law. And what the SSPX are going to argue is that, look, some of these canonical um, procedures and, and some of the regulations there in canon law, they're not necessarily conducive to the salvation of souls in these extraordinary circumstances. Therefore, in some cases, we have to not obey this particular canon and not work within that particular canon because ultimately so the salvation of souls is at stake and that's what needs to be given priority over canon law. And, and very theoretically speaking, that's true. I don't agree if that I don't agree that any of that applies to what Lefebvre actually did. Uh, but but it's certainly true that you know canon law is there to, for the salvation of souls, not the other way around. Um, so the the bishop is basically saying, look, that was his intention. It's not to break away with the church, not to break with canon law, it's not to just thumb his nose at the Pope. No, his his primary motivation was for the salvation of souls and the purity of faith. And you know what? I'll grant that. I, sure, I, I really do believe that that's the case. I don't think that gets him off the hook because I really think that that's also the case for Martin Luther. I really do think that you could say the exact same thing about Martin Luther. Um, not that Luther and Lefebvre are in the same category. I think Luther was way worse than Lefebvre. But I could certainly say that you know Luther intended to, you know, save souls he believed that he was preserving the faith and he's just wrong but that's the context so pay attention to the context and then listen to what he says next seelen ebenso die erhaltung der reinheit des glaubens denn der glaube ist for faith is the path to salvation therefore it must not be falsified It is from this principle. Der Weg zum Heil. Er darf daher nicht verfälscht werden. Von diesem Grundsatz aus muss die Bruderschaft und ihr Grün. It is from this principle that the SSPX and its founder must be viewed and judged. It is in this sense. Let me repeat. It is in this sense that betrachtet und beurteilt werden. In diesem Sinn hat sich Papst Franzis Pope Francis spoke to me and said they, that is the SSPX, are now schismatics. Full stop. Full stop. What most people are doing right now, they're not even going to the video. And if they are, they're just showing a screenshot of this. They're not showing you everything that just came up to that point. And I'll show you why that's significant. They're just saying, look, Right there, Pope says, SSPX are not schismatics. Uh, there's, there's at least three problems that I could think of here. Number one, he said, in this sense. In what sense? In the sense that 
the intention and motivation of Lefebvre, and we could even say by extension ministers and priests who adhere to the SSPAs, their intention is the salvation of souls. Their intention is not to operate as suspended priests. Their intention is not to violate canon law. Their intention is not to thumb their nose at the Pope. Their intention is not to be disobedient. Their intention is, first of all, the salvation of souls. And I would say, yeah, that's probably true of a lot of SSPX priests. I would even grant that that's true of Lefebvre, even though objectively he's still violating canon law, and these priests are still violating canon law. I imagine their intention is good, and it's for the salvation of souls. In their intention, in this sense, they're not schismatics. In the subjective sense, they're not intending to be in schism. And you know what? I agree with Pope Francis. I agree with him. And I've been saying that, by the way. I've been making this distinction. I agree that your average SSPX priest out there, and even Lefebvre himself, they don't intend to be in schism for Christ Church. I really don't think that that's the primary motivation. I think that they really do believe that they're preserving the faith and that they're doing this for the necessity of the sake of souls and their salvation. That's the intention. But that doesn't remove their canonical and objective status as being in a state of schism. And Pope Francis never said otherwise. So if Pope Francis actually said this, we can agree with him and still say that the SSPS is in schism. Objectively speaking and canonically speaking, the group as a whole is in schism. Does that mean that every individual or even its founder, are they're somehow intending to be in schism? No. I don't think that their intention is necessarily schismatic. Objectively, are they in schism? Yes. I can say the same thing for an Eastern Orthodox priest. I, I really do believe that your average Orthodox priest does not intend to be in schism from Christ Church. I really don't believe that that's their motivation. I, I don't think that they, they really have formally uh, adopted a schismatic mentality. I, I just don't believe that. In, in speaking to so many Orthodox priests, that's not their intention. But objectively, are they in a state of schism? Yes. Yes, of, of course they are. Objectively. Canonically, objectively, Orthodox priests are in a state of schism. Subjectively, in an intention, I really don't believe the majority of Orthodox priests are in, are in schism. I can, again, say the same thing for um, people who are in the SSPAs. So... What people are doing is they're ripping it out of context and they're giving the impression that Pope Francis is saying that somehow canonically and objectively speaking, they're not in schism. He doesn't say that even according to this bishop. He doesn't say that. According to this bishop, all he's saying is in the intention, in the interior disposition, that's not where their heart is at. Their heart is for the salvation of souls, and he's right. Their intentions are not schismatic on the whole. Maybe you got some SSPX people out there. They actually do have evil intentions, and they do intend to be in schism. Like, maybe there's a few of them out there, but I just don't think that that's the case with the majority of people who are in schism. I, I just don't believe that. But it doesn't take away from the fact that canonically they still are in schism. Number two. The other problem with this is, so not only are people putting a spin on it that is foreign to the video itself, they're taking it out of context. Number two, we don't have a direct quote of what Pope Francis said. So I'm having to go based on what this bishop is saying and how he interpreted Pope Francis. Since I don't have a direct quote, it could be that he misinterpreted something that he heard Pope Francis say. And given how incredibly sympathetic and how much he's effectively bought into the tenets of the SSPS, I am inclined to suspect that he probably interpreted whatever Pope Francis said in, in a skewed way. Um, so could be that Pope Francis actually said this, and even if Pope Francis said that in the sense that Pope Francis said it, according to the bishop, that's true. It doesn't remove it from the fact that they're still objectively in schism when it comes to the objective realm and canon law. But I do have some questions on whether or not Pope Francis even said that since we don't have a direct quote and since I very clearly see in this video that the bishop has an agenda and that probably would skew the way he interprets something that Pope Francis said. Pope Francis could have very well said something about 
you know, the intention or the interior of people who are in the SSPX, they're not schismatics in that sense. And he could have taken that to mean, therefore, they're not in schism, objectively speaking. So that's also a problem here. We don't have a direct quote, and I'm not so sure that I'm very confident in his interpretation. Um, last part here. <clears throat> Third part. Um, even if, let's say, the Pope said something like, well, even canonically and objectively speaking, they're not in schism. Let's let's just go with that, even though I have no reason to believe that, and I actually have reason to believe the contrary. Let's just go with that. That all that would do is that would just show that the Pope is mistaken in his assessment of the SSPX. And mistaken evaluations of somebody is not authoritative and it doesn't overturn their canonical state. Pope Francis would have to actually put that into canon law for it to be authoritative. Now, if Pope Francis came out tomorrow and put into canon law, like they're regularized, they are in full communion, okay, all right, that's authoritative and he's right, and we have to uh, assent to that. But if Pope Francis were to just say that and not promulgate it, that's not authoritative and it doesn't overturn the facts. One other thing. Why are people going with hearsay, and then even so, hearsay out of context, hearsay over and against what Pope Francis has actually directly and explicitly said? Why? We have the direct words of Pope Francis elsewhere in his thoughts of the SSPX. Let me give you an example. For one, look at this. Letter of the Holy Father... Francis to the bishops of the whole world that accompanies the apostolic motu proprio, traditionis custodis. I know I've spoken about this in other videos, but for those who are not familiar, here he directly says, the faculty granted to the indult of the Congregation for Divine Worship in 1984 and confirmed by St. John Paul II in the motu proprio Ecclesia Dei in 1888 was above all motivated by the desire to foster the healing of the schism with the movement of Lefebvre schism. He explicitly calls it a schism there. Now, in defense of somebody who adheres to the SSPX, they could say, well, what he's saying is at the time that Lefebvre did this, Francis believes that, you know, they were in schism. So at the time of the illicit uh, consecrations and at the time that his excommunication was authoritatively uh, confirmed, Pope Francis believes there was a schism then, but Pope Francis is nowhere saying that that schism remains now, and they would try to argue that uh, the SSPX is no longer in schism now, at the very least, at least within the mind of Francis. So I agree this isn't a slam dunk that Pope Francis thinks they're currently in a state of schism. All this would prove is he, at the very least, thinks that at one point in time there was a schism with the SSPX. He's not necessarily saying that there's still and a schism with the SSPX based on this alone. So I, I do want to steal, man, the SSPX position there, because I think some people miss that, and they quote this as if it's a slam dunk in the, against the SSPX, and I just think, well, not exactly, and for the reason why I just mentioned. No, it could be that Pope Francis intends this to mean that even now it's still in schism. But we actually have something else <clears throat> from Pope Francis that will clarify things. This is from Pope Francis in 2016. So obviously, again, recent uh, as far as Pope Francis's understanding of the SSPX. Misericordia et misera, 2016. And here he says this, and uh, shout out to Andrew Bartell, who mentioned this about a month ago in his uh, Catholic World Report uh, article engaging this, this issue. He says, for the Jubilee year, I had also granted that those faithful who, for various reasons, attend churches officiated by the priests of the Fraternity of St. Pius X can validly and licitly receive the sacramental absolution of their sins. For the pastoral benefit of these faithful, and here's the kicker, and trusting in the goodwill of their priests to strive with God's help for the recovery of full communion in the Catholic Church. I personally decided to extend this faculty beyond the Jubilee year. He's saying, look, the reason why I'm trying to, and I am making their previously invalid confessions now valid and licit, 
The reason why I'm doing that is I'm hoping that SSPX priests will regularize themselves and come into full communion with the Catholic Church. Now think about that for a second. If you are a member of the clergy and you're not in full communion, by definition, you're in schism. You might not be in schism to the degree of, you know, somebody else, perhaps maybe an Eastern Orthodox priest, because I think they have additional impediments. But if you're not in full communion and you're a member of the clergy, there's still a degree to which you are in schism, by definition, by virtue of the fact that you're not in full communion and you're operating outside of that full communion. That is why there is still an element of schism here, objectively. Now, on the subjective level, a priest who operates this way, on the subjective level, are they necessarily um, formalizing schism in their heart? Not necessarily. I, I can't judge that. I have to assume no, unless there's really good reason to believe otherwise. I assume no, and I leave it up to God to judge whether or not they've willfully formalized schism in their hearts, but I could still say objectively they're in schism. Again, the Orthodox priest, I assume the majority of them don't intend to be in schism. So I'm not judging them on the personal and culpable level. There, there may not be personal sin involved, even though objectively speaking, they're in an objective realm of sin because schism is sin. So um, that's important because that tells us what Pope Francis thinks of them even after granting lyceity and validity to their confessions. That does also mean all of their uh, sacraments. He's, he's specifically here talking about confession. So even after this, he still believes they're not in full communion. And again, if you're a member of the clergy and you are operating in a ministerial fashion, Without the authorization of the church, and in and there are many ways in which they still operate without the authorization of the church, even after this, and you're not in full communion, then objectively speaking, you're in a state of schism. It may not be as bad as some others, but you're still objectively in a state of schism. You may not necessarily be personally culpable and going to hell but you're still objectively in a state of schism and you need to regularize that and fix it because who wants to, you know, really bank on that, right? Just because there may be a mitigation and circumstances and an ignorance there, who really wants to bank on that? Only God knows the heart ultimately. And even sometimes we can deceive ourselves with our own heart and our own evaluation of our heart. So we always want to do everything that we can to regularize ourselves with God's law through his church and to fully reconcile ourselves with Christ and his church. So why is it that we are going to out of context quotes that are, I'm sorry, out of context hearsay that is not even a direct quote. And it's again, out of context. Why are we using that to somehow override objective, direct, explicitly clear words from Pope Francis elsewhere? I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why people are doing this. Some are doing so out of ignorance because they didn't know that they put a spin or somebody else has put a spin on what the bishop said or that they're hearing hearsay. Others, I imagine, have an agenda, and that is to try to act like there isn't a schism with the SSPX. They're doing everything they can in their power to try to say there's no schism here, when in reality there is, there still is. Again, see the SSPX playlist where I talk about this in more detail there. Let's uh, wrap it up here, and let's go to the next part. Uh, let's take a look at the 13-minute, 51-second mark. Um, and here he's going to offer a defense of Lefebvre's dissent against the magisterium. And here I mean theological dissent against the magisterium. He's going to try to defend why Lefebvre is theologically in dissent with the Catholic Church's teaching authority. Because that is the case. L lest we forget, he rejects the current profession of faith of the Catholic Church, promulgated by John Paul II. He rejects it. 
Why? Because in the third paragraph, it requires religious submission of intellect and will to non-definitive teachings of the magisterium. And he doesn't like that because he knows he would then have to accept the theology of Vatican II. And he believes the theology of Vatican II is somehow uh, disruptive and is contrary to theology that he has to assent to in the preconciliar period. All right, so let's watch. Das Ergebnis war ein oft unbemerktes, verdecktes, verschlüsseltes Abrücken von... So he says here, uh, the result was an often unnoticed, concealed... Das Ergebnis war ein oft unbemerktes, verdecktes, verschlüsseltes Abrücken... Cryptic, moving away from tradition, from the authentic teaching of the church. He's saying in the post-conciliar period, this is what the church is doing. And he's, and he's not talking about people who are in dissent from the magisterium like your progressives. No, he's saying the church itself, the teaching authority, the magisterium is moving away from the authentic teaching of the church. The magisterium is moving away from tradition, which is factually not true. Rücken von der Tradition, von der authentischen Lehre der Kirche, sowohl in den... Both in the documents of the council and in the ensuing magisterium. There you go. So he's not talking about people who are disobeying the magisterium. He's talking about the, dis, the the magisterium itself is in descent from the magisterium of tradition. And he's saying the council itself, Vatican II, and the current magisterium is, objectively speaking, in discontinuity with tradition and the past. Again, false. I challenge that. This, this is my bread and butter. I'd love to take him up on this. Uh, Bishop Vitas is welcome to come on the show. I will debate him for this. I would love to debate him on that. Again, this is my bread and butter. I'd be happy to show that he is factually wrong about this issue. And I challenge anybody who would say that there's rupture in the church's doctrinal teaching between the pre-conciliar church and the post-conciliar church. You have your work cut out for you, and it's not going to work. Um, and again, I could show evidence to the contrary. But here we see he's presenting this errant position. And it is an errant position that does, by the way, incur some theological censors, as I've demonstrated on this channel before. So I do think that the uh, the bishop should be censored by the Vatican for this. And is already, um, by his own admission and what he's saying here, under some theological censors. But it's clear he's bought into the SSPX, because this is one of their talking points, that Vatican II itself, like the actual teachings, are in discontinuity with the past, and the current magisterium is in discontinuity with the past. Dokumenten des Konzils, wie auch in den nachfolgenden lehramtlichen Schreiben und den And decisions. Here lies the deeper cause of the crisis of the church. This is also the reason. Scheidungen. Hier liegt die tiefere Ursache der Krise der Kirche. Hier liegt. And uh, I'm sorry. Why the father of the SSPX, Archbishop Lefebvre, could not follow unreservedly the instructions. Vater der Bruderschaft, Erzbischof Lefebvre, den Anordnungen und Lehrentscheidungen des Konzils. And doctrinal decisions of the council and the official church announcements that follow the council. Und den dem Konzil folgenden offiziellen kirchlichen Verlautbarungen nicht vorbehaltlos zu folgen vermochte. His attitude was factually justified and, so he's justifying this theological dissent. Again, the bishop falls under various theological censors for this impiety and, and false teachings that he's promoting here. But notice what he says next. Entirely in line with the faith of the church, his actions in dissenting from the magisterium in the post-conciliar church and from the council itself, his actions are entirely in line with the faith of the church. He should have been listened to more. Oh, but it gets worse. In the Glaubens der Kirche, er hätte mehr angehört werden sollen. Das Vorgehen. The measure taken against him was a grave injustice. So here, there you go. St. John Paul II, grave injustice against Lefebvre in excommunicate, unjustly excommunicating him, according to the bishop, because Lefebvre had every right to dissent from the council and its teachings and later post-conciliar teachings because they were in discontinuity with 
the past. This is the same error of the progressives. They're just on the other side of the coin. This is why I say your radical traditionalists, they're the other side of the same dissenting coin as your radical progressives. Both see radical rupture with Vatican II and the preconciliar church. And both are wrong. There's no radical rupture. There's continuity substantially. Um, let's move forward because it, it, it gets even more concerning. Because it is easy to prove that the government of the church has moved away from tradition. Um, again, with all due respect, Your Excellency, please come on the show and let's debate that one. If that is so easy, please come on the show and let's debate that. I'll get an interpreter. I'd love to have a discussion with you on that because I think you're factually mistaken here. And this is very dangerous to people to put forward this false teaching. Rücken der kirchlichen Leitung von der Tradition ist leicht nachzuweisen. Es ist nicht eine. It is not a subjective emotional perception of the Archbishop. Eine subjektive emotionale Wahrnehmung des Erzbischofs. Die Haltung. The Archbishop's position on the Council is clearly expressed. Des Erzbischofs zum Konzil kommt in einer Begegnung mit Papst Johannes Paul dem. In a meeting with Pope John Paul II on November 18, 1978. Listen to this. Zweiten am 18. November 1978 klar zum Ausdruck. Auch sie ist durchaus. This position is also absolutely correct. In a letter, the prelate reports the following. Das ist korrekt. In einem Brief berichtet der Prelat das Folgende. Was das Konzil betrifft, so habe ich. Quote, for the council, I told the Pope that I would be ready to sign a phrase. Ich ihm, dem Papst, gesagt, dass ich bereits eine Formulierung wie diese vorgeschlagen habe. Like this, I accept the acts of the council interpreted in the sense of tradition. Ich akzeptiere die Dokumente des Konzils, die im Sinne der Tradition interpretiert werden. Er hat sie als... He found it fully satisfying and completely normal, in quote. Let, let me stop there. This, this itself, show the, the bishop himself does not see that there's discontinuity with what he just said previously about Lefebvre in this itself. And that's because Lefebvre himself changed his positions. He, he changed his theological position in evaluation of the council. Before the bishop agreed that he's dissenting from the council itself. And here he's saying... Oh, but no, he's willing to accept the entire council as long as it's interpreted in a traditional sense. But wait, those are not the same thing. Those are not the same thing. Moreover, what the bishop fails to tell you and account for is, yes, this is all good and fine that Lefebvre says, I'm willing to accept the teachings of the council as long as they're interpreted with a sense of tradition. Amen. Of course you should. What do you what, what do you really think that we're saying that you need to understand it in a way of rupture? Of, of course you have to go with the past, of course. Any progressive that would tell you otherwise that you have to believe in rupture, they're wrong. And the magisterium has never said that you have to interpret it in a way that's in discontinuity. It's a straw man. Of course you're to interpret it in the sense of tradition. That's true for every council. Not just the 21st Ecumenical Council. That's true for Trent and everything before it. That's true for Florence and everything before it. That's true for Ephesus and everything before it. Of course you interpret it in the sense of tradition. So if Lefebvre is willing to assent to all of its teachings, and that includes Dignitatis Humanae, by the way, as long as we interpret it in a way that is in the sense of tradition, I have no qualm with him. Great. Well, at least I have no qualm with him in his theology here. Great. Wonderful. But that's not the position that Lefebvre maintained later in his life. And the bishop doesn't tell you that. The bishop doesn't tell you that Lefebvre changed his position here. He just presents this, and he's like, oh, look, see? He's not doctrinally in dissent. But why didn't he account for the fact that when John Paul II promulgated the profession of faith, Lefebvre explicitly showed that he was in doctrinal dissent and explicitly rejects, uh, rejects the third paragraph of the profession of faith. Again, I have videos where I've reviewed this and shown it. He is theologically in dissent at that point because he's not going to say well i accept the third paragraph and i accept the teachings of vatican to 
in the sense of tradition. And therefore, I'm willing to embrace this profession of faith because that's all John Paul II was expecting him to do. He rejected the profession of faith because he knew or he believed that he could not interpret Vatican II in a way consistent with tradition. So he rejects the profession of faith because he knows if he accepts the profession of faith, he has to be able to maintain that Vatican II is in accordance, um, in accord with preconciliar teachings and that they can be harmonized. But he no longer believes that. So he rejected the profession of faith and called it modernist and, and all kinds of things. Why doesn't the bishop tell us that? Perhaps profound ignorance. Maybe. I don't know. But they need to account for that. Whoever is catechizing him, whoever is infecting him with these errors, they, they should probably tell him, hey, you know what? You do want to account for the fact that Lefebvre did change this position well after this quote. Just FYI. Voll auf zufriedenstellend und ganz normal empfunden. Auch die Haltung des Erzbischofs, the Archbishop's attitude towards the See of Peter, dem Stuhl Petri und dem Stellvertreter Christi gegenüber, and the Vicar of and the Vicar of Christ is also correct. For he says, pay, pay attention to this part, because this is also very, very, very misleading. His attitude on the Vicar of Christ in the Pope in the See of Peter is correct. So sagt er zum Beispiel, es steht fest. Quote, it is certain that the Pope is imbued with liberal principles. Dass der Papst von liberalen Ideen durchdrungen ist, wenn es un If this fact forbids us to follow him when he acts or speaks. Es auch aufgrund dieses sicheren Tatbestandes untersagt ist, ihm zu folgen, wenn er in ein in conformity with these errors, it must not lead us. Klang mit diesen Irrtümern handelt oder spricht, so darf uns das jedoch nicht zu to disrespect and contempt this out out of this out of respect for the see of peter furchtlosigkeit oder geringschätzung verleiten dies aus achtung vor dem stuhl petri den er inne hat which he occupies we must pray for him so that he only affirms the truth L let me just stop there congratulations lefev you literally just affirmed eastern orthodox ecclesiology congratulations because that is what a high Petrine Eastern Orthodox ecclesiology looks like what we just heard right there. That's not Catholic ecclesiology, what we just heard, but it is Eastern Orthodox ecclesiology, which I always find to be ironic. Um, because you could literally take some quotes from some Eastern Orthodox saints who descent from the Petrine ministry of, of St. Peter in the way that we understand it, and you could present their very high view of the Petrine ministry in the papacy. And present it to an, un, a, a Catholic who you know has a faulty understanding of ecclesiology. You could present it to them and they're like, yeah, I agree with that. And then you let them know, by the way, that's not Catholic ecclesiology. That was an Eastern Orthodox pushing forward Eastern Orthodox ecclesiology, which, which is why I go to say these guys are ripe for the picking for the Eastern Orthodox. If they just if they just pay attention and, and knew that you're, you're kind of late to the game. If you're going to assert this view theologically, you're a little late to the game. The Eastern Orthodox have been saying this for a long time. So why are you wasting your time in this limbo phase with the SSPX? Why don't you just go to Eastern Orthodoxy? They were right all along. And you know what? When people find that out, a lot of them end up going to the Eastern Orthodox because they don't retrace their steps and say, well, maybe I was wrong in my understanding of ecclesiology, which is what I'm trying to do here and just say, wait, don't go to the Eastern Orthodox, but just take a step back. You're wrong in your understanding of Catholic ecclesiology and the Petri ministry. Um, but the bishop presents this as if somehow this shows that his Lefebvre's ecclesiology was Catholic. And, and I just, I have to smile and think, it doesn't. It literally shows his ecclesiology is Eastern Orthodox. <laughs> How do you not see that? But okay. Um, more, moreover, moreover, listen to this last part. Wir müssen für ihn beten, damit er einzig und allein die Wahrheit bekräftigt. 
We must pray for him uh, in that he works exclusively for the establishment of the reign of the Lord. Und ausschließlich an der Errichtung der Herrschaft unseres Herrn Jesus Christus. All right, so again, it kind of sounds nice the way he presents it, even though it's Eastern Orthodox ecclesi ecclesiology, not Catholic. Um, but what makes it even worse is he said it in the context of, you know, Lefebvre, he, he's trying to he's trying to uphold the see of Peter, not disrespect it. But what he doesn't tell you is elsewhere Lefebvre says things like this. Let me read it to you. Quote. The see of Peter in the posts of authority in Rome being occupied by antichrists, end quote. The see of Peter being occupied by antichrists. Sound familiar? Yeah, that was what Luther and a few other Protestants were saying. He doesn't respect the see of Peter in all quotes. He disrespects it and accuses it of being occupied by Antichrists. So he's saying the Pope is an Antichrist. And that's just one quote. There's many others, and they're not taken out of context. That one is literally found on the SSPX website. Direct quote. <laughs> Why give this misleading information and present it this way? And try to present Lefebvre as, look, he's just trying to defend and bolster the See of St. Peter and just call its occupant to the truth. But he's not doing violence to the See of Peter itself. Um, Yes, he is. If the occupant of the See of St. Peter is an antichrist, that does violence to the See itself. Because these aren't just, you know, scandalous behaviors that its occupant is doing. No, he's attributing it to the actual teachings of the occupant of St. Peter. His teachings are faulty and in, in, er, errant and antichrist in nature. That then has certain ecclesiological implications that are not in accord with the First Vatican Council. And I'm not referring to Vatican I's definition on papal infallibility. I'm talking about its understanding of the See of Peter as the principal source of unity. He doesn't tell you that, though. Why, why is that? He doesn't account for that. Why is that? Maybe profound ignorance on the bishop's part? I have to hope that that's all it was. But it's very clear to me at the end of the day. The bishop is perceiving uh, Lefebvre with rose-colored glasses on. I think that living with them in this way, they have infected him with a very, very, very flawed understanding of the founder of say the society of saint pius the 10th and uh looks like this uh retirement in the sspx house has not been helpful for the retired bishop but in in summary in summary i wanted to again highlight the fact once again people take things out of context and run with it and put a spin on it which is why it's important whenever you start to hear this kind of stuff don't let your hair get on fire, start running around going crazy, just pause and actually go to the primary source itself because you'd be shocked how many times people are putting spins on it. And as we saw, he told us in what sense Pope Francis allegedly said this. And it's in a sense that still is in accord with canonically and objectively the SSPX being in schism, which is the position that we know Francis actually accepts elsewhere as I demonstrated. So anyways, I hope this was helpful. If so, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. Of course, check me out, patreon.com forward slash reason of theology. If you uh, want to get more extra content that's for uh, patrons only and you want to support what I'm doing here. All right, we'll see you later. God bless. Hey, everybody just wanted to tell you about my new free ebook, Church Chaos, Biblical Insights for Confused Catholics. If you are a confused Catholic and you're thinking about leaving the Catholic Church or you're thinking about converting to the church, but you see that there's a crisis in the church and you're just unsure, this is the book for you. Again, it is free. Just simply go to reasonandtheology.com. You'll see a pop-up that comes up on your screen. Just simply click on it and you'll put in your email and it will provide you the free PDF ebook right then and there. Please check it out if you're confused about the situation in the Catholic Church today. Reasonandtheology.com.
Are you confused about how Catholic teaching authority works? With encyclicals, papal bulls, councils, and many other things, it's easy to get confused on what is authoritative and what is not. Fortunately, at MaximusInstitute.com, I have prepared a course explaining the magisterium from A to Z. Visit the website and check out the course Understanding the Magisterium for more information. Is it possible that ancient aliens created other ancient aliens? Ancient alien theorists say yes, but then is it also possible that ancient aliens created the ancient alien theorists? And are the ancient aliens and ancient alien theorists led by the Vatican headed by the Pope? Ancient alien theorists and certain unnamed Catholic YouTubers say yes. Tired of Catholic shows that peddle conspiracy theories that sound like something out of an ancient aliens episode? Check out Reason and Theology for a more reasonable take.